I'll see your corporate VA and raise you one. Hi, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to Prairie Lights. Tonight, artist, writer, and curator Matt Friedman will read from his memoir, Relatively Indolent But Relentless, a Cancer Treatment Journal. Lawrence Westler calls the book harrowing, hilarious, humbling, triumphant. Friedman underwent radiation and chemotherapy at Massachusetts General Hospital for treatment of <coughs> adenoid cystic carcinoma, a rare cancer that had spread from his tongue to his neck to his lungs by the time it was discovered. Just before he and his wife Jude drove their dog, drove with their dog Flurry to Boston to begin treatment, Friedman was given a blank 240-page sketchbook by his colleagues and students at the University of Pennsylvania with a commitment to numerical exactitude that would become mildly alarming as the story progresses, Friedman decided that he would complete four pages a day, a routine that would fill the entire book by the end of his treatment. Matt Friedman has received an NEA Fellowship in Sculpture and New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Fiction Writing. Recent solo shows of his artwork have been held at Pierogi, Five Miles, Big and Small Casual, Valentine, and Studio 10 galleries in Brooklyn. He's a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Iowa. In addition, Matt was a cartoonist for 12 years out of college. His strip, Free Associates, was published in The Onion, The Chicago Reader, The Philadelphia City, City Paper, and his writing has been published by Cabinet Magazine and the Pierogi Press. He's going to do some drawing for us tonight here, as well as talking about his book, so please help me welcome Matt Friedman. Um, I was so complete I don't have to do as much an intro as I worried I would have to do. Um, but I will give a little background um, for why I'm up here like this. The first reason is I it's a very difficult book to read. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but also it doesn't really make much sense to read because it is an account of this sort of in, this complete experience and uh, it's more immersive rather than literary. It wasn't even designed really to be looked at. So the, the guy I usually perform with is Jim Spelios, who's a wonderful artist and, and, and percussionist, um, suggested to do the whole book which appealed to my uh, mildly obsessive interest in numbers, and it seemed like it would work out if we could do 30, pa 30 seconds a, uh, a page. It's a 60-day account. We've done 30 minutes, everybody can go home. It's hard to keep at that pace, especially without a drummer here. So Jane has a, a small bell. I want to demonstrate the bell. It, if, I, if I get too far behind, so trying to bell me off and I'll keep moving along. Um, and uh, there, is there any other? Yeah, so you don't know, there's no drummer here. I'm going to go fast. Uh, and the, the, the history of the, the disease everybody you know, is familiar with as I was when I basically began. So um, here we go. So the, the book begins on uh, October 3rd, the first day, a couple days before treatment, and I give a sort of brief account of where I'm at at the time, which is that I have discovered tumors in my tongue and in my neck, and then as they're sort of uh, scanning for these primary sites, it turns out there's cancer in the lungs as well, which for which there's no treatment, but there can be proton treatment in the head and the neck, so that's where I'm at at this point. Uh, the next day, I'm come contemplating the sort of oddness of having a rare disease and how it doesn't really fit with my sense of myself, which was formed as a child when I went to a baseball game and sat in the stands with 50,000 other people and looked down and saw nine people on the field and realized I would never be a baseball player, but I also thought it would protect me from odd and unusually unpleasant things like cancer, this sort. Uh, I woke up the next day, day three, uh, before the treatment with a kind of, in a sort of a nightmare where I had somehow thought that Sloan Kettering had <laughs> called and said that I would messed up my paperwork and therefore they could no longer treat me and that also I had leukemia and AIDS. 
<laughs> the next day uh, would be October 6th, and um, I'm obsessing with time of death. And I made it first of many eccentric graphs that had really not, nothing helpful to do with my treatment, but I thought the Lindbergh baby died at around six months, and then it would be Joan of Arc here, and then uh, <laughs> Anne Frank, and then maybe Mozart, and uh, uh -huh. all, the, you know, all the rock and roll people at 27, <laughs> Jesus would be here, Steve Jobs, my grandparents, I'm, and I was kind of contemplating where I'd be here, and then at the very end, at 120, was the oldest lady in the world who died, but she'd known Vincent van Gogh when she was a child, but she didn't mean to him, and that was... There was an editorial about how you shouldn't be mean to people when you're young because they may turn out to be famous even if they're unpleasant. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's helpful. I, I have no more discursions. Uh, so the last day in New York, my dog Flurry went outside and uh, attacked a small cat. And by the time we came upstairs to try and find the cat, it was sort of mangled and, and crawling away. And instead of doing the right thing, I ran downstairs to get a towel and find Jew to help me come back up and take care of the cat, and it had crawled away to die a horrible death, and I thought, even at this late state in my life, I still wasn't able to take action, which was disturbing. The next day, I took a bus or a train, I can't remember which, up to Massachusetts, to Boston, where I was undergoing the treatment, and my friend Ellen showed me around the house that I was going to be staying in, and her dog went out in the backyard and killed a squirrel. It <laughs> seemed to reinforce the problem. Uh, of foreboding, but then she told me a story about her dead horse, which had come back to her and spoken to her about the place it had gone to, and how it was a nice place because there were no snobs there, <coughs> even though the horse itself had been a snob in life. <laughs> the next day, I was thinking about the problem of being able to see inside yourself and the difficulties that that causes in life, which it obviously just caused for me. And I was thinking about my brother Josh, this is an extraordinary uh, doctor and researcher who when he uh, did MRIs on brain function, used himself as a model and discovered to his surprise that his brain was filled with big hollows full of water. And he should have been severely retarded instead of brilliant, which he was, because his brain had rewired itself. And I guess I was still hoping that I too could rewire myself. But the next day was October, uh, October, uh, tenth, the first day of treatment, and I was in the, the gantry room where this uh, proton therapy occurs, which looks like something out of Star Trek. It's a circular room that moves around uh, over 360 degrees. You're strapped down on a gurney. The specially designed mask is strapped to your face. You're strapped down, and then you move in, and this thing shoots, comes around, and can shoot the uh, proton beam radiation into your head and neck at any angle that it decides you need. I woke up the next day in the middle of the night, I guess. But the first symptoms of this treatment, which is a terrible case of dry mouth, the next morning I went in to see the oncologist who told me I probably wouldn't be able to make it through the treatment uh, uh, continuing to eat and that I would have to be put on a gastrointestinal tube, which for some reason disturbed and offended me and it became my quest for the next 60 days to stay off of this thing. Uh, I was able to uh, go back to New York the next night. They told me weekends would be off, but this was the only weekend I ever actually got to go. Before I left, my brother Tom and his son Noah did a little dance for me, and Tom told me, Tom works in Washington, that uh, in order to get more respect from the doctors, you shouldn't be wearing flannel shirts and blue jeans and a, a hat, but you should wear a pinstripe shirt and dungaree and uh, like I guess khakis and loafers. But it was too late for me. I'd already established my lack of street cred. Uh, the first day in the, the first day in New York, I went to a gallery, and my friend Bob gave me a fifty-dollar bill as so I was walking out of the gallery and told me to get some dinner. So Jude and I went to a restaurant where this is what you can get for fifty dollars in New York: a bowl of kimchi, a bowl of wontons, two bowls of soup, and some ice cream. And then for the tip and the tax, that was 50 bucks. So that was a very nice thing that Bob did for us. Uh, I was, Sunday, I was thinking uh, more uh, sentimentally about Jude and me. I'll get to Jude in a second. Uh, one of the nice things about getting cancer late in life is that if you're not married, you have to get married in order to get health insurance. And so on the spur of the moment, we went down to City Hall in New York. Uh, and we had no rings, so we brought Sharpies with us, and 
the city clerk at the crucial moment said you may now perform the ring-like ceremony and draw rings on each other's fingers and we swore that we would renew our vows every morning with the pen but of course we never did uh, <laughs> Jude drove me back to New York and just a few more details about Jude I met her here in Iowa and the first time I saw her she was wearing a Winston Churchill siren suit like one of those one-piece suits and she had old-fashioned golden roller skates on her shoulders and I thought she was a I thought she was a, a freshman, but she was actually a professor. And she, uh, <laughs> she was out of my league, uh, she was, and, but I cleverly cut my thumb in two on a machine, and she had to take me to the hospital, and that's how I broke the ice. So I thought maybe there's some good news that can come out of medical accidents every so often. The next day, uh, I began to catalog the deterioration of my neck. The burns were becoming uh, quite evident, and I didn't really know what was going to uh, develop. I identified myself three or four personalities. One was the, sort of this big baby who was crying and needing a lot of attention, but I kept out of sight. Then there was a sort of Mr. Cool who didn't really care about anything and sort of uh, joked his way through the experience, but then there was this more uh, uh, increasingly significant character, the sort of Joe Pass who sat on a couch all day waiting for things to happen. And then I discovered another personality, the sort of, you know, the wisdom old cancer guy who sat in the uh, waiting room and told everybody else what the experience was like in there. After just two days, I was already developing these irritating habits. Um, on day six, uh, you were allowed to bring music in instead of listening to their um, sort of music. And they, that day was Hey Jude. I began to catalog the music I brought in. I also uh, took note of an interesting fact, which is that we had parked in stall 406. And for some reason, to try to remember 406, a number came to my head, which was that Ted Williams is a uh, Boston Red Sox, the last man who had hit over 400. And there's a lot of history to that, some of it which involves Stephen Jay Gould and the University of Iowa, but I don't want to get being so if you ask me about that later, I'll tell you. Um, Chemotherapy, the, I had to take chemotherapy once a week to sort of soften me up uh, and make the uh, radiation more effective. And uh, so for a couple of hours a, a day, they sort of drip this into you. And you're sort of assigned a, net, a nurse who you're supposed to bond with, who sort of helps you through this experience. And at the end of this first session, she casually mentioned that uh, the idea behind this treatment was to give me two good years uh, and see if somebody could invent this cure for the cancer, which instead of being reassuring, was quite disturbing, it, as though somehow, somehow I they told me something that I wasn't supposed to know. Two years from then is exactly right now. So, so far she's wrong, uh, at least she's wrong about what I thought she was saying. Josh and his family, the, the brilliant doctor with the holes in his head, came the next day from California to spend time with me, and his son Abe is the kind of kid who tries to figure everything out, asked me, as I was driving them to the hospital, if I was going to be the first of the uncles to die because I was sick, and I said, well, that was my plan, thinking it would be joking, and I nearly felt terrible for telling a six-year-old boy something like that, but he was fine with it because that was, in fact, exactly the answer he was expecting to hear. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night the next night, which was a Saturday, sort of disoriented, and I remember falling down and breaking a stool, which disturbed me because my idea of being cool was coming up against reality in the way I hoped. But it reminded me of my professor here at Iowa, a man named Julia Schmidt, some of you will remember. And one day, uh, when we were pouring iron, which is all Julia allowed us to do, he blew himself up by putting a wet skimmer into molten iron, blew himself up and became completely disfigured, drove himself to the hospital, and then cured himself by shaving his face with a naked razor to avoid scarification. And I thought, well, no matter what I do, I won't be able to pull that one off. The next day, I went to the 10th year anniversary, uh, the 10th anniversary of Josh and his wife, and we ate, I, I made a careful list of the lasagna and the cake and the tomatoes and the pie. I, I ate a tremendous amount in my effort to stay off of the feeding tube, even though I couldn't taste anything, which was increasingly disturbing. Then I went to a concert where a 14-year-old boy, a uh, friend of, I guess it was the, my, my brother's uh, nephew and played a, a Bach concerto for cello on his bassoon and his 
uh, eight-year-old brother played Pink Panther on a stand-up piano wearing his underwear. <laughs> Um, the next day, the first of many images of the tongue pain began to appear. Besides that early wrinkled tongue, I was grasping for bad metaphors. So it was razor blades pushed into the side of the tongue, pins in the front of the tongue, thick nails at the back of the tongue, and a chisel at the bottom of the tongue. Um, I also was having trouble speaking at this point, beginning to lose that uh, competency. The next day, I began to make uh, drawings about falling off of cliffs. I mean, but I had been told, you know, not just about the G tube, is that sooner or later this experience would be diff difficult to tolerate. So I was always waiting for the next bad thing to happen. And it was never that I was there; it was that I was in the process of being there. If food was not being edible and nothing was tasteable and pain was, m was mounting and I was starting to worry about medication, this was the first time I started to worry about that. But I also began to worry that I would not, no longer be able to sort of understand the experience if the drugs I was taking <coughs> numbed me uh, too greatly. Uh, the next day, uh, I think it was James Brown, it's hell uh, on, the radi on, the, on the disc, which was actually very, very helpful. But I began to write about the sort of experience of being under this mask, uh, being radiated, and how I could get through it. And it was, it was a kind of weird sort of presence you're supposed to have and absence at the same time. You have to focus and not lose your focus as fluids begin to accumulate in your mouth in this sort of waterboarding position for 30 minutes. And I thought how difficult that was for me because having any kind of focus is difficult if you feel like you have a certain attention deficit disorder problem. Uh, the, as the lymph nodes began to shut down, fluid began to collect in the chin, and I began to detect this double chin, and I started to worry that this would I'd end up looking like you know, an English character actor by the end of the whole experience. <laughs> and I began to, uh, I knew that there were three possible outcomes for the neck, you know, that the, if the muscles atrophied, you'd end up with a, a pencil neck, uh, if, the, if the burns never went away, you'd have a kind of redneck and uh, or you get the sort of saggy goopy neck and so I thought I think of by writing those things down I didn't have to worry quite so much about them if they actually happened uh, the next day I began to mix up the days I noticed in the book I would think it was one I, I thought I'd finished the page and I hadn't finished the page and so the book because I was obsessed with the four pages a day so I began going backwards and forwards in time which makes sense I I also got my first fentanyl patch, which is sort of a transdermal patch they put on your side in order to sort of feed you this sort of numbing uh, medic opiates uh, 24 hours a day. And that made things a little bit more tolerable, but also increased my sense that I was losing track of what's going on. Uh, I was trying to stay at, pay attention to the outside world as everything began to close in on me more. And for some reason that day, the image of the story that caught my attention was a terrible story out of New York City about a nanny who had murdered two children and then slit her throat, uh, and then the parents had found her in the bathtub, and New York made a big deal of that, and of course I had a nightmare that night that I had done the exact same thing, but my main concern was that nobody would take care of me if I did something like that in this condition. I went out to my friend Jack's house the next day. He lived in the countryside, and I'd known him since college when he'd been my roommate and he built a barn by hand and he moved rocks and boulders for 25 years and made this beautiful place that I'd never seen before um, Before then. Uh, there were also beginning to have be stories about a superstorm that was on the horizon that was coming and I began to worry that I'd be stuck in the hospital when all the power went out and I would become like the lost prisoner in some terrible Bastille thing and they find my skeleton strapped to the proton therapy machine six months later. Um, next day is October 29th. I'm actually 40% done. A good chunk of the time is, uh, is, uh, is passed. And we go to the store. We buy a lot of frozen food in preparation for the storm. We find a dead bird on the sidewalk, which seems ominous in some way. Um, and uh, at about 4 o'clock, the power goes out in Boston. Uh, and it stays out for a while, which uh, actually never affected my my um, my treatment. But the pictures in the newspaper and on TV and on online that night of New York City 
uh, began coming in. My friend Bill sent a picture of 10th uh, Avenue D in 10th, you know, and this picture of his car floating down the avenue, and all hell is breaking loose. Uh, meanwhile, I'm trying to eat a bowl of soup, and I'm thinking I, that that was, was in the equivalent of a catastrophe for me, with the soup versus the city uh, going out. Um, my mother, uh, meanwhile, was trying to eat as much food as she could before it went bad, including eating all the eggs that we had. Uh, she came from Pioneer Stock, and uh, the story that most characterizes her family side of my history is her, her grandmother fighting off an eagle in the middle of the Kansas prairie who was trying to take <laughs> Uncle Henry out of the bassinet. <laughs> <laughs> Power comes on the next day, uh, but now there are pictures of New Jersey underwater, Jersey City, where a lot of my friends are. Somebody sent a, this very eerie photo, uh, video uh, of their basement slowly filling up and everything that they own uh, being washed away. Uh, it occurred to me that, in this funny sense, my time in Boston undergoing this uh, treatment uh, had sort of like a dream that, you know, before I went, you know, I had this tongue with cancer in it, and I was living in a city that looked one way, and that now I'm here, and my tongue is on fire, and the city's underwater, and at the end of it, maybe my tongue will be okay, and I'll come back, and the city will be back to normal, as though nothing had happened, and so I closed my eyes while something terrible had happened. Went to a museum the next day, and saw lots of extinct uh, mammals, a woolly mammoth, and a saber-toothed tiger, and um, they also had a room full of living butterflies, which are supposed to give you a kind of an uplift, and they were pretty, but there were lots of broken, uh, dead butterflies in the mud at the bottom of the thing, which is what attracted my attention. Uh, the next day is November 2nd. I'm actually halfway done uh, with the treatment, and for some reason I wasn't feeling particularly triumphant, and I tried to make a drawing, which is even more difficult to do upside down, which is I felt like I had my head up my ass. Um, <laughs> and, um, I was, it was very disorienting, and one of the more disorienting aspects of the whole experience is that you don't really think you're fully experiencing the experience. And I, I began, uh, one of the more interesting diagrams that popped up, the proton therapy is good because it has something called the Bragg curve. You hit a point of maximum penetration of the tumor, and then it falls right off. So there's not supposed to be a lot of bad things happening after that. And that inspired a lot of very bad diagrams that interested me. The God curve, where everything gets better, and then the art versus death curve, which I thought, you know, as death approaches, most art deteriorates, so the bad poet curve. And most of us sort of meander along like this, and only a few people, like maybe Anne Frank, get to better work if we get close to the end. Um, I noticed the next day that the burn on my neck looked exactly like pre-revolutionary Russia, complete with a red <laughs> spot where my, uh, where Moscow and my horrendous burn was. I also kept a count, very careful account of what it sounded like to be uh, under this mask as the uh, as the accelerator starts to spin, and the and and then these, you hear a whir, and then there's a series, there's a kind of network of pipes that click and clack as magnets snap into place to direct the beam, and then the spreader, uh, which directs the radiation towards your face, begins to, and, and it, I thought, I thought it was something worth keeping uh, note of. Uh, the next day, another metaphoric image of the tongue. This time, a pair of scissors, snipping the tip of the tongue, off. Um, my mother left, I was sort of being cared for by this uh, revolving um, flotilla of family and friends, so my mother left, my brother Bart came, my mother, oops, um, and it was sort of like the changing of the guards at Buckingham Palace. Uh, we also visited the tree that had fallen down and had knocked the power off several days before. Um, my mouth was continuing to tighten at this point, but my face was beginning to bloat, uh, which meant this mask, which was already designed to fit snugly over my face, could hardly fit uh, on the face anymore. So the whole routine of radiation became more and more difficult. They had to smash the, uh, the mask in place and then quickly duct tape it into place, which didn't seem to me to be 
so the kind of high-tech work you'd like to have with the protein. Because <laughs> there are often this thing would snap in the middle of the radiation, and I'm just standing there trying not to move um, because I'm afraid that that would be the last thing I ever do. Um, more patches and a careful inventory of all the spit in the house. There's a thick yellow goo and all the, and I couldn't keep up with it, and I wasn't being very tidy, so there's lots of napkins filled with all this stuff around. And then that was also the night that there was a presidential election. I became sort of obsessed with the idea that there were the sick people and there were the healthy people. The healthies were like running around having their wars and their elections while the sick people were just trying to keep track of spit. Um, but we were still happy enough with Obama's win that we had my brother pour two glasses of Jameson and I tried to taste some of it, but even it within 16 inches of my face was more painful than anything I'd ever tried to do before. Um, as the uh, treatment went on and my ability to eat was uh, getting worse, I began to become obsessed with numbers. As opposed to eating food, I was basically drinking numbers, and I devised various ways of using high-calorie uh, drinking substitutes and pure oil to get a count of up to 750 calories per drink. My first goal was to hit drink 2,000 calories a day to maintain this weight and stay off the tube. And then 2,500 and 3,000, it kept going up and up and up as uh, the treatment got more and more ardu arduous. But I became more and more interested in numbers uh, in this way. I think uh, the new metaphor was not the cliff, but the pit and how you would kind of walk across the pit or fall into the pit. and. Um, the next day, a new metaphor, trying to drink a glass of water was like trying to swallow an angry cat because the pH balance in my mouth had now altered to the point where uh, water tasted like acid unless you put a lot of salt into it. Besides, I like drawing the cat in the drink. Uh, I also learned how to hack antidepressants into a new kind of mouthwash as I had developed a tolerance for the normal mouthwash. And you can really numb your mouth with uh, methadone if you try. And uh, I also began to worry that I would lose my mind and run naked through the streets, <laughs> killing people. Uh, and I didn't know whether I had a plausible defense. Uh, I thought I'd take a day off uh, from trying to keep track of things by drawing a, a still life of all the bottles of drugs and drinks and arguments that I was beginning to ingest to get through this, but I really didn't have the patience to finish it. So it's just sort of outline. There's also a series of pictures that day of the people, the other people in the treatment room. Uh, the man who was getting treatment through his eyes, he had sort of a raccoon face. And then the man who was getting some sort of treatment inside his face, so his face was burned here. Then the woman who had no hair whatsoever, and then the woman in the turban and the, and the, and, and the cane, and then me with my increasingly strange looking neck. We never really talked to each other, but I guess we were taking note of each other as the days went by. Um, Jude came the next day, and it was very nice to see her. She also brought Flurry along, so I kept a diagram of what it's like to have people in your bed after not having people in your bed, with one of them being a large and restless dog. And so the dog slept here, and then the dog slept here, and then the dog slept all around. <laughs> but since I had to get up every few minutes to go spit or clear various valves, um, that didn't make anything easier. I, I was now I was now up to like 3,900 calories a day um, and becoming increasingly interested in getting even higher. Um, at the time, I was working on a series of very small figures that I wanted to give to uh, the various caretakers that I was um, dealing with, doctors and nurses and, and receptionists and technicians and food specialist. And it wasn't really just to be nice to them, it was somehow to have some agency over the experience of being in treatment and show them that I wasn't just another ugly uh, tumor. Uh, but uh, it was also interesting to realize that as you worked, you somehow lost track of pain. That sort of focus was very helpful uh, at that time. My cousin Todd came with his family the next day, and I'm very close to Todd. Uh, he's a, a boat builder and a carpenter and a surfer, but about four years before this, at the, in, the, in his 30s, he had a massive stroke which had been badly diagnosed, and so he'd lost a lot of capacity for speech and movement on one side of his body, and it reached the point where it was very difficult for us to speak uh, to each other, but now I couldn't speak at all, and he could speak somewhat, and so it was very nice to see him again, and uh, at one point in the day, somebody had said something to me about 
how well or how brave I was, and he said, he's not brave, nobody's brave, you just sort of have to do what you have to do, and he was right, uh, and I realized that was what was going on with the other people in the treatment at the same time. Um, I was now up to 4,100 calories a day, uh, uh, <coughs> maintaining my weight, which caused me to think, I realized I was becoming somewhat obsessive, and uh, I had a, a childhood history of obsessiveness, which I hadn't really talked about, uh, but I figured in this book is might as well start. Uh, and so I'd had a series of, uh, a, 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 a period in my life when I prayed to God with increasing uh, elaborate uh, rituals, thinking that if I didn't make it worse the, every day, I'd get smitten or smitten or smot or somehow. And then I moved to the uh, the bathtub, and I'd sit in the bathtub, tapping the bathtub, and then counting and splashing, and then since I had to make things more difficult, I ended up standing on the tub, balancing and shouting, and then my brother Bart, six years old at the time, noticed me, and he went and got my father, who was actually a psychiatrist, and told him I was standing on the bathtub counting or something, and he came in and said, get the hell off the bathtub, which turned out to be extremely effective therapy. <laughs> <laughs> November 19th, uh, 14th is now <laughs> chemo day, and my weight is going, um, my weight is fluctuating. I tried to get fat, thinking that would be a way of staying off the tube, but it only created a higher bar for me to maintain. Uh, and so I had to double my efforts to, to keep drinking more calories. Um, I also, uh, was for some reason, the day that Donald Petraeus, the general, had, uh, you know, career had gone up in smoke when it was discovered that he was, um, sleeping with his biographer, and I thought, what characters, I guess, for some reason, I thought he, he and, Jer and uh, Julie Schmidt had something in common, that he, having radiation, he'd probably be shaving his neck with a blade as well. I don't know why I made these connections, but I did. Um, the next star, the scars the next day made me think about uh, permanent disfigurement and all the things or people I'd ever been compared to, and whether, um, I would never look like this again. When I was a fat little kid, the girls called me Baby Huey. And then when I was an older person, I was compared to Hellboy, the, uh, the red-faced Ron Lieberman character. And my face was about the color, color of uh, Hellboy at this point. So it was a particularly apt comparison. Um, where are we? Oh, yes. The worst day. The worst day is the next day, for some reason. I was being very relative all along, but... Uh, for some reason, I decided to November 16th was the worst day of the treatment, and um, I, that was sort of a uh, relief to say that, but I realized I guess I was waiting for the next uh, acceptable time to have the next pill or drink or whatever it was that would sort of ease the pain of what I was going through, and I wasn't proud of that. I felt like uh, at the end of this kind of intensive treatment, you were sort of revealed as this sort of little monkey pathetic little monkey with a very red neck, and um, that was not a happy insight into myself. Uh, I was now up to four, you know, I was teetering on the edge of 4,000 calories a day. There was also a war in Gaza, and I sort of forced myself to look at pictures and draw pictures of the war in Gaza as the healthies were blowing themselves up again. Um, I was uh, drawing another picture of the tongue in my mouth this time instead of pins and needles, I drew St. Sebastian pierced with arrows, which gives you an idea of perhaps how out of my head I had gotten at this point. Um, <laughs> Sunday, I had radiation on Sunday in preparation for the long Thanksgiving weekend, and I was imagining myself as someone on a tightrope, and I was also fantasizing about the three possible uh, deaths that could occur in the course of treatment. One was that I was uh, drowned on phlegm, the other was that I would spontaneously burst into flames if somehow how they turned up the protein machine too high one day. And the other was simply that my head would pop off of my neck under pressure for, for no particular reason. Um, I was told the next day, November 19th, that uh, the tube was now unlikely, that I had somehow, um, I hadn't passed the, you know, I, I was not safe, but it was, it should have been good news, but it, instead it sort of depressed me that I wasn't, I didn't have anything more to shoot for. So I wrote a long, complicated uh, description of how you prepare for the radiation session, how you have to gargle and then floss and then spit and then take a couple of pills that are time to kick in just before the thing starts. And then you gargle and spit and you try to go in with as little fluid in your mouth as possible so that by the time your period is over, you're not choking to death. 
Um, this day, uh, I was drawing images of the waffle impressions on my face that the mask had caused that weren't coming away. My tongue had now been demoted from a saint to a mere monkhood for some reason. It sort of had a red, sort of phlegmy, I don't know, part of it was yellow, part of it was red, it looked for some reason like Friar Tuck to me. My neck was now stiff and I couldn't move it, which meant I had to sort of look straight ahead at all times. And when you're in the middle of all this, you're not really sure if it's all going to come back or not, which is the most disturbing part. My family, some of my family came for the Thanksgiving weekend and Jude noticed uh, that there's no hair on the back of my head. I don't know why nobody else had told me that, but sometimes it takes a friend to tell you things that other people won't say, the harsh reality is hard to take. She also had an idea for uh, what to do about our ring situation, which was that we would tattoo the rings on each other, and then we wouldn't have to worry about drawing things on. So we threw a couple of tests up, but of course, we never got around to that either. Um, the next day is November 22nd, it was Thanksgiving. Uh, but uh, for me and for people of a certain age, November 22nd is always the day that Kennedy was shot, which probably led to the most tasteless drawing in the whole book, which was a comparison of the autopsy photos of Kennedy post-assassination and the trails of the bullet going through his head and his neck and the same trajectories of the radiation going into my head and neck. But we went to Lexington the next day to see the uh, bridge where the shot heard around the world occurred, began the American Revolution. I didn't realize that right across this little stream is the house where Thoreau's father, uh, grandfather lived and watched this all go down and Thoreau wrote the Nature and started the Transcendental Movement there 50 years later, which seemed interesting. And then we went to visit my friend Stan, who uh, had been a uh, student with my father, and was now 97 years old and healthy as a horse, he expressed condolences for my condition. <laughs> uh, November 28th, uh, I was now mastered the 1880 calorie shake, uh, and my went out to see my friend Jack one more time at his farm, <laughs> and he insisted that I get on his backhoe and move boulders, which was quite an act of friendship and bravery. I'd never driven one before and I was out of my mind on drugs. I wasn't even allowed to drive a car <laughs> and I was operating the biggest machine I ever had in my life. So, that was nice. Um, November 25th, I created a diagram of the day, which is really sort of depressing because it basically involved sleeping and then sitting and then taking drugs and then sleeping and then sitting and then radiation and then sitting and sleeping. Somewhere in here would be the hour or two when I got to make the book, but it was Basically, not much going on there. Um, I made a diagram the next day trying to combine the things that were currently in my head, which was how to drink a high calorie shake, um, how to row a boat. I rowed in boats when I'd been in college in Boston, and so I was thinking about how athletic uh, endeavors uh, work or don't work, and then how to survive. Um, radiation. And it occurred to me that none of these things worked very well. Uh, well, actually it wasn't radiation. It was art. None of these things worked very well when you were thinking about them. You think, <laughs> is this doing me any good? You can't drink. If you're thinking about rowing, are you, am I rowing very well? You, you fall off the boat. And if you think you're making a good work of art, it probably isn't. And it probably won't be. Um, the next day, um, I don't know why, I think I saw a picture in the paper of, you know, very classy Manhattan, you know, sort of this red drink that looks an awful lot like the rocks said I was drinking. And I thought it would be very nice to be able to drink a classy drink, even though it seemed like it was an extremely unlikely possibility. Uh, I also gave the, finally gave the last present to the oncologist who supervised all of the um, radiation treatments. And since he'd been making me stick out my tongue this whole time to, uh, examine the effects of his treatment, I thought it was only appropriate that he get a sculpture of a man sticking out a tongue, uh, which I didn't realize that I'd given to him was potentially offensive. And he's this very uh, sort of uh, spectrum-y kind of German guy, and then I gave it to him, he said, I will try not to take this personally. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
the last day, this is the last day of treatment, um, November 28th, and you have to ring this bell and recite this terrible poem about my treatment's done, I'm on my way, hip hip hooray, or something like that. And then everybody claps, and you pose for a picture, and you go home. Um, in, the, uh, in, in the sort of exit interview with this, I, I finally asked the doctor if anybody had gone through this treatment without being highly medicated. And they said, oh yes, the, you know, every so often. There was a, an old lady, she was 80 pounds nothing, they said. And we were basically, we were melting her face off. And every time we asked if she needed uh, any medication, she said, no, God is my friend and is looking out for me. So I felt, the competitive part of me felt very uh, crushed that I'd been beaten up by God and this little old lady. On the other <laughs> hand, I finished my treatment at 4,002 calories a day, which seems to echo Ted Williams' treatment in a kind of pleasant sort of way. The next day is the day after everything's over, and I sort of numb. I'm just like the man cleaning up after the elephant in a parade. Um, and I don't really have much to add to anything, but I'm sitting like a zombie in a chair, and I notice that my foot, which I hadn't noticed the entire time, had become this incredibly ugly, wrinkled, yellow thing. It had dehydrated like the rest of me, and somehow that attracted my attention. The next day, I got to go back to the hospital and pick up this mask, which I'd gotten very fond of. The radiation in it had faded enough, so it was safe to take home. Also, the bite block that had been in my mouth, which had protected me from the radiation going up into my head. But my mouth had tightened up to the point now that I couldn't even get it into my, past my teeth, which was extremely disturbing. Um, Jude and our friend Joy drove up with Flurry the dog uh, from New York threw me in the back of the car with all the stuff, and then drove back to New York in one fell swoop with me, sort of dozing in the back. The next day, the last day of the book, I'm trying to write a very sentimental ending, thanking everybody. Uh, and meanwhile, Jude and Joy are moving in new toilets and, to and, and, garb and garbage and things, that rebuilding the infrastructure for my rehabilitation. Then I discover, of course, that I miscalculated. There are two more pages to fill in the book. And so I took another inventory of the spitting and flossing and drinking and medication I was going to have to do before going to bed. But then in a moment I know I claw on the bed and Jude was here and the dog was here and the cat was here and I get to snuggle in between them for a couple of minutes, which would be wonderful, and then I'd have to get up and spit. Thank you. <laughs> You, everybody can take any drawings they want, <laughs> especially if you buy a book. <laughs> um, Matt's willing to answer questions, so if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll bring the cordless microphone so your question will be picked I'm going to try and wash my face too, but if it turns out I look like Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so questions. Raise your hand. I'm wondering how it felt to get back to or recreate your regular artwork, because that's your living, um, after completing this book? That's a good question. I, I, I don't think there is an answer, because I don't think I have. I don't think I've gone back to making regular artwork, which is kind of distressing. Um, it became, I mean, I think in the course of making the book, it became such an interesting subject. And since my recent work in the years before that had been sort of trying to tie lots of strange tendrils of histories that were factual and non-factual together. Um, it didn't make much sense not to address this. So the first, I mean, I, I had, I, the first few pieces I did were um, definitely, I didn't want it to be about the, the treatment itself or the history of the cancer, but sort of about something else like bad luck. Um, I didn't expect to do much with the book and because it was just a journal, but then that turned into something that sort of took up more of my time. And the year since then, I've done other kinds of projects, but, you know, the, just the sort of reality of living with this disease um, means I haven't been able to put it out of my head. And since the work I do is sort of close to my experiences, it doesn't make sense to do that. On the other hand, I don't want to be the cancer guy artist, so I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to confront that at some point. Sometimes it helps to have other things that distract you, so I, I work with other artists on other projects that 
keep me off myself for a while. Um, did you realize while you were making the book that ultimately you would want it to become a piece or a product? And if so, did that at all change what information you were putting into it? Spoken like a true artist. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a it's a tricky thing. I didn't. I I had I knew there was at least one audience, which would be people who would read the book who knew me and loved me, and if, if you know if I didn't survive very long. And so I didn't. I didn't, I didn't want the book to be hurtful to anybody, and so I, I, I definitely kept it focused on kind of my subjective experience at the time. With sort of other speculations, I didn't, I didn't indulge in the wildest stuff in my head. And like any artist, I think I remember John Dill when I was asking a question like that of an artist who kept work that didn't, wasn't supposed to be public. And, you can't ever. I mean, if if you're, you can't ever work that way. I mean, otherwise you might as well stay in the garage and we never, uh, never let the stuff out. So you have to think about that to some degree. But I had a long experience writing lots of manuscripts that I used in my work that never were read. And part of the idea behind them was that they became encased in something and became objects. And so I was comfortable with the idea that wouldn't really see much of an audience. It was originally just a, an artist book for a show that came up immediately after I got out of treatment. So I made a very short run of something that looked like the notebook. And that would have been fine for me. Uh, but it is, yeah, it's, uh, yeah you, you're, trying to, you're trying not to think about somebody reading it. On the other hand, it became clear to me as I was building it that it was more interesting than I thought. And I also thought, I mean, I made the book to remind myself that um, I had an experience that couldn't be sort of massaged into a, a memory that as soon as you go through something, any kind of experience, you begin to create a kind of fictive narrative around it. And that happens in the course of a day, but I sort of like the idea that this thing would be a record of all the minutia of the experience so that I would sort of understand how, how, how susceptible I was to all kinds of trivial preoccupations which seemed massive at the time. And I thought, I knew other patients had gone through the same thing, so I thought, at least a doctor should read that. <laughs> <laughs> Did people look at it while you were doing it? No. No, that was something I, I didn't want anybody to look at, because I didn't want anybody to tell me anything about it that would affect the, what I was putting into it. Um, how did you arrive at the, this format of doing the drawings and with the drummer and, and all of that? Well, um, years ago, uh, for a show about artists who were performers, which I wasn't at the time, uh, somebody had told me about this vaudeville tradition called lightning sketches or uh, chalk talks, uh, which were very popular back in the day for a variety of reasons. and. Um, it seemed sort of perfect to me because it allowed me to, I had this history of writing and also drawing this comic strip and also being afraid of talking in front of crowds. So I thought, well, maybe if I do this, I have a reason I can go up there and do it. So that, that went through a lot of evolutions, mostly, I mean, the first, the first way of doing it was similar to the way the original men and women did it, which was to draw on an easel. Sometimes the easel would flip because the drawings were supposed to actually evolve sometimes in, to su in surprising ways. But as I did more and more of them, I sort of left the format behind and I did big murals. And then for a, a night at a gallery where everybody's supposed to do rants on a soapbox, um, Tim and I just hung these things around our neck. And, and that, that seemed interesting in a way because I, the less equipment I had, the more interesting it was. And also drawing upside down while you're talking gives you an excuse for making bad drawings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always looking for that. <laughs> I'm wondering if your current recollections of the experience and when you read the journal, if those are the same or different? Or they're different. They're different. I mean, I, I, every time I have to look at the book, and I don't, for a practical reason, like for editing it for the publication or for reviewing the notes for doing something like this. I'm increasingly 
aware of how difficult it was for me, even though I didn't think it was difficult. I mean, I, even though there's all this stuff here, I, I was sort of aware, as long as I was keeping a record, there was a sort of a buffer between me and this idea of the abyss. And I never really felt, I think, as out of control as I was saying I was, even though I was worrying about being uh, drugged and numb. I felt, as long as I was saying that, that somehow I was protected from it. But the evidence of the book is sort of overwhelming, that even though I, I was trying to do that, I, was, I, was, I wasn't functioning at, at the same level as I wanted to be, and it's kind of helpful to see that, in a way, because that's exactly why I did the book. Because at a certain point, you just say, well, it was tough, but it's fine, everything's fine. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Thanks for the drawings. Oh. Uh, oh, I have a question. Uh, personal goes into fictionalization here. How comfortable uh, you are for your own self, and to what degree percentage does, if it happens, the fic fictional fictionalization goes into the work production? Because especially when you mention like you write manuscripts, I think what is the mindset up and how that mindset up translates into a secondary or like this additional format which is like once written you know because I think one always has this idea of like adding something into it is mm -hmm. that personal or does it get fictionalized well as far as <coughs> the information that's in the, the book itself I try to be scrupulous about only saying either what I observed or thought I observed or um, memories I had that I acknowledged were subjective but were not I didn't attempt to um, invent the most, I mean, I was, I think I mentioned several times about the sort of use of various metaphors, and the metaphors were, for me, the kind of fictionalization of this. I, they were a way of objectifying an experience and also distancing myself from it, and also, in some ways, occluding the experience, because I didn't really know how else to do it. I was trying to find the most raw imagery I could, but I was also sort of being a little bit playful with it, and I, I think, you know, it's a little bit, a little bit Heisenbergy. I mean, just the act of, of observing yourself changes things. So I was a little uncertain about, you know, if I wanted to draw a picture of, um, you know, a building falling down in Gaza, I was aware that I was trying to sort of force myself to look at the world in a way that I wasn't doing it, and that. The, the book as a record would then reflect something which wasn't necessarily was on top of my mind. David, do you have a Oh, I don't know if you had any, any second thoughts about something you wrote and edited later. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tried not to intrude on anybody's privacy in the book, and I did intrude a few times and offered to take it out, and then when that offer was accepted, withdrew the offer. <laughs> 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 because I thought, uh, I mean, it, it was kind of important to me that the book just stay what, the way it was, I think. And, um, uh, you know, I figured, I figured who would remember in 10 years anyway. So. Yeah, but it's true. I mean, I, I think, I, 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 I felt it was, it was pretty, I was, I, I, I felt like I was keeping it fairly light, but of course there's always something that doesn't. And actually reading it again, now I'm even more amazed at how much I did intrude on people's privacy in a way that I didn't really think I had. So maybe I have to go around and apologize to lots of people. Yeah. So. All right, well, I think we are about out of time. But um, Matt Friedman, Friedman will be happy to talk with you and sign books for you and maybe get you a little chalky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah good. I won't sign them, I'll just put a thumbprint on <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you. I'm serious, if you want any of these drawings, take them home. <laughs>